Hello and welcome to this video tutorial from computergargard.com and in this video we are going to look at the new forecast sheet feature of Excel 2016. So you do need Excel 2016 for this demonstration. Forecasting has always been possible in Excel. Uh, we have had the trendline feature of charts. There have been forecasting functions, but this new feature provides a quick insight into future trends. It is a very quick visual forecast of your data. Now I've got some pretend data on my screen. <clears throat> I have some dates uh, grouped into months and I have some pretend sales figures. And I've got two years worth of figures here. You know, the more dates you've got, the better understanding it's going to have of your trends. Now this can be any kind of date interval, can be any period, could be hours, could be quarters, could be weeks, but it will need to be consistent and it will need to be grouped. So I've gone for months here. It's important that this is grouped uh, consistently by some kind of date or time period. And then just some values to use as well. They're the only two columns you need for this feature. Now it does not matter if I have missing data points or duplicated data points so much, as long as it's not too crazy, as the forecast sheet feature will work with that. And we'll see a bit of that in a moment. Let me just click somewhere in this list and click the data tab up above and the forecast sheet button on the far right hand side there and it will show me a preview of my data and a forecast. So here we go using the historical data to create a quick visual forecast. Now this will appear on a different worksheet when it's ultimately done. Now you see it's gone straight for a line graph here. I have the blue line showing me the actual data and the orange one is the forecast. It doesn't look too great at the moment, but we're going to do some tweaks to that. The lines up uh, above and below are the upper and lower confidence bounds. Now the first thing you may notice here is the forecast end. It's currently set as June next year. My data finishes um, on the, as you can see on the blue bar, of December of this year, the, at the time of doing this video, December 2017. Now let me adjust that forecast end date. This is one thing we can do. Let me adjust it to the entire of next year. Let me pick the 1st of January 2019. And as soon as I do that, it adjusts it to taking a forecast for the entire next year. Now there is an options button just below. Let me have a click on that. And we can see some of the extra options available to us. So we've got the forecast end and forecast start. You can even decrease that forecast start to see what their forecast would have been for your actual data, which is quite interesting. But we have this other stuff below, which I'm slightly more interested in for now. And the first thing I guess would be the seasonality. Now it defaults to detect automatically. And that's a good strength of this feature. Microsoft explained this as a one click forecasting. That's what they're calling this, which is a little bit misleading in respect it's probably not one click, but you can understand that they're saying it's a very fast and easy way of getting an insight to your data. Uh, don't read too much into it being the greatest forecasting tool. There are different functions and different algorithms out there. But one of its great strengths is how well it detects your data. Now here I'm going to change it though. I don't think it's detected my data that well. Now my seasonality is 12 because um, I've got monthly data and this is kind of annual sales. So I want to say every 12 months is a season. I'll choose set manually. I'll change the value to 12. And you can see what impact that's made on the preview of the data. So it's a much better forecast straight away there. Now it understands my seasonality. I've got that drop in January, then a slight increase again. Now we have this confidence interval of 
indicating that they believe 95% of the values will fall within those bounds. So you see these upper and lower bounds. So if I was to decrease that confidence interval, you see the bounds get closer because they have less confidence that the values will fall within those bounds. It always defaults to 95% and I'm quite happy with that here. The other thing I wanted to mention in here um, really is the one in the bottom right about aggregating duplicates using an average. Now I mentioned that it doesn't matter so much if you've got the odd missing data point, missing month, or if you've got the odd duplicated month, if June is in there twice for two different types of sales for some reason. Now what they will do by default is calculate an average there. They will just average the two values. That's what they'll do. So you have the potential to change that to maybe a sum or a count. And the option you choose, I guess, depends why that duplicate is appearing. Uh, do you want to find the average of the two? Or, or are there two sales values because they've come from another source? So you may want to sum them up. That is one monthly sales value. So if that stuff is happening in your data, you want to make sure you've got the right function being used uh, right here. And there's also an opportunity to include forecast statistics. So if you're familiar with this kind of information, then you can tick that box and you'll get this table of forecast uh, stats, uh, which I'm not massively familiar with myself, so I'm not too interested, but you can do that. You get to these various metrics up here. Now, if we click OK, oh, sorry, one last thing. There is a button at the top to change the chart type. So it just defaults to line graph, but you can also have a column chart if you prefer. Use this error bars there for the uh, upper lower confidence bounds in that scenario. Now I'm going for the line graph. I'm happy with the line. I'll click on create. It will create this new worksheet for me and put my chart on it and also a table of values. So my real values are still on sheet one. Don't worry. Nothing has happened to those values. But on sheet two now, I have those values repeated. And below, I have their calculated data. And if I click in their cells, you can see above the functions that they have used. You can use these functions and do this yourself. So, you know, you have greater control over what's going on rather than their quick uh, one click forecast sheet as they call it so you can see they're using a forecast dot ets function uh, exponential smoothing is what that is that's the algorithm there and we also have these other functions being used for the upper lower bound confidence intervals and you can get stuck into that if that is something that you are interested in and confident in doing Otherwise, the whole point in having a button is because most people are not confident or as confident in doing that. And they just want a quick insight, you know, into what to kind of roughly expect. And that is what this does. Notice that the values that were created are not linked to the initial values. So if data changes on sheet one, there will be no updates here. It is a standalone uh, forecast sheet. It's not going to update itself unless you change the values on this table uh, in some way, shape or form. At which point you might as well just create another sheet considering it's only a, maybe a couple of clicks. And that is the new uh, forecast sheet feature of Excel 2016. It is a great quick way for anybody to quickly get a visual of a forecast of their data trends. I hope you found this video useful. Please check out some of our other video tutorials on our YouTube channel and come check us out at computergaga.com.